Hello. <laughs> Hello, Denby. Uh, Hello. Some of Denby. Uh, <laughs> I'm Hugh. Uh, um, you reach my age, a man starts to look for his legacy. Uh, I don't know if you can see from where you are, but I have got extraordinarily long ear hair. <laughs> which I know disgusts some people, but that encourages me. Um, you're familiar with the story of Samson and Delilah, and uh, Samson lost his strength when he had his hair cut. But what you're probably not aware of is during the Vietnam War, the only GIs who were allowed to keep their hair long were the Native Americans that they used to track the Viet Cong in the jungle. Because they said that having their hair cut interfered with their psychic ability to follow the tracks of their enemies. Well, this interested me, but I, I discovered it's not just the hair on your head. The hair on your ears actually acts as a psychic antenna, <laughs> and it enables you to track people's thoughts. Seriously. So uh, don't worry, I won't reveal what you're thinking, it's, uh, yet. Um, but uh, and if you doubt me, uh, this has been known about, you know, and it enables me to hear in extremely loud environments by tuning in with my ear hair. If you don't believe me, if you've ever, ever watched the Houses of Parliament and heard the noise going on and wondered how in hell they understand each other, they shout it all the time. Ear hair! Ear hair! Ear hair! <laughs> so, uh, yes, anyway, uh, my name is Hugh Roberts, a good Welsh name. Um, but as you can tell, I don't sound Welsh at all. Uh, that's because I grew up in London. Yay! 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 <laughs> don't know where that came from. Um, and there is a bit of a thing between the Welsh and the English, which uh, I've experienced from both sides. Uh, about 10 years ago, I got arrested uh, by the police in Bath. I used to live near Bath in Bristol, actually. And I got wrongfully arrested, I would like to point out. I am a good boy. Um, but they didn't know that at the time. So they took me to the station, and the desk sergeant said, Name? I said, uh, Hugh Morris Roberts. Date of birth? I said, 7th of the 5th, <laughs> um, And where were you born? And I paused a moment, because it's, uh, I thought you might have trouble spelling this. I said, what the actual specific place I was born? He said, yes, the specific place you were born. I said, oh, Sandy Hulk Corny. He said, well, where's that? I said, well, it's in South Wales. He said, that'll do. And then he said, what are you doing here then? <laughs> and I, Is it for work? And I said, well, no, I was born in, born in Wales, but my parents moved to London and I grew up there and then I moved to Bristol. And he said, well, you're near a home then. <laughs> I, did, I, I felt like saying, well, you know, just give me a couple of lambs and a bag full of leeks and I'll get in a coracle and I'll roll back over the seven. <laughs> so it still goes on. And there's a certain amount of, um, what do you call it, uh, inadvertent irony I've noticed. I've just moved down to uh, Nahuntliff, lovely area down in Mid Wales. But uh, one thing that struck me a bit odd, I've met an awful lot of English people who've moved to Mid Wales and they're all complaining about immigration. <laughs> it's just a bit weird, isn't it? But talking of inadvertent irony, I think the, the absolute master of saying the opposite of what she should was um, the minister who worked in the church. I used to, let me explain, you'll find this hard to believe, but I did used to be a teacher. I know. Um, and I used to work in a preschool playgroup in Bristol. And um, we were based in a local Methodist church. And the minister of the church was about the least Christian person you can imagine, despite the dog collar and the rest of it. And uh, it, three times a week, I would take the children into one of the rooms next to where we had the playgroup room. And it was the Christian fellowship room. All the rooms had a little brass plaque. And um, I'd take them in there, read a story, wait for the parents to come and collect them at lunchtime. Sometimes the parents would come in, sit in on the story, all very lovely. Anyway, one day, I was just getting to the end of the story and there's a room full of children and parents sitting there waiting. Uh, the Gruffalo, actually, is the story, if you're familiar with that. So I'm just there and I'm just getting to the last page of the story, which is, no, 
not very many words, nearly, nearly finished. And the door opens, the minister walks in, and she says, will you be long? I said, no, I don't have to, just, just got one, one page, a couple of minutes, we'll be done. She walked out, I said, sorry about that, nearly finished. So I carried on. 30 seconds later, maybe a minute, the door burst open again, and the minister comes in, points at the plaque and goes, this is Christian fellowship, get out! <laughs> Not a lot you can say to that, really, is there? So, um, yeah, just look at my hand to remind myself that there must be something else. Yeah, good old Audrey. Uh, actually, the minister I found out, I won't tell you her whole name because she's still alive, but I discovered that her name was actually an anagram of Satan Death Fury. <laughs> Make of that what you will. Um, you might be surprised that I used to be a teacher. You'd probably be even more surprised to discover that as a young child, I was actually very shy and uh, withdrawn. And like a lot of shy and withdrawn children, I had an imaginary friend. Trouble was, my imaginary friend was painfully shy and socially <laughs> awkward, and he had his own imaginary friend, and they used to play together and leave me out. <laughs> Kids can be cruel, can't they? So, uh, yeah, um, you know it's the guitar. Um, what started me, um, started me performing, actually, was um, quite a sad event. Uh, both my brothers died suddenly, within a month of each other, of uh, completely unrelated causes. But they were very competitive, so it was a close finish. <laughs> and um, but around that time, I found myself going to rather a lot of... Um, a lot of funerals <laughs> and uh, you know sometimes you're just not feeling it when you're getting a funeral so uh, it just occurred to me there's not enough songs about crematoria are there so uh, I wrote a little ditty it's got a nice nice verse please uh, chorus I should say not a verse nice chorus please feel free to join in oh yeah oh we're gonna burn your mum in the crematorium She's had a life full of living and loving But now she's going inside the oven Oh yeah, we're gonna burn your mum In the crematorium <laughs> When we burn her, we won't rush her After we burn her, we gotta crush her We gotta crush up the pieces real small Or she won't fit in the urn at all Gotta be small, or she won't fit at all. Well, we already put my dad. That was pretty rad. It ain't really all that bad. It was the best bonfire he's had when we put my dad. I did not feel sad. Oh, we're gonna burn your mum. In the crematorium She's had a life full of living and loving But now she's going inside the oven Oh yeah, we're gonna burn your mum In the crematorium Ashes to ashes, dust to dust The folks at the crem are the ones to trust To turn your body back to carbonized dust in dust we trust You know that you must Return to dust People getting buried, don't you worry about them You're much better off burning down at the creme Hell, they can even turn your ashes into a gem They really are the creme de la creme Down at the creme You can't beat them Everybody now, come on, we're gonna burn your mum in the crematorium. She's had a life full of living and loving, but now she's going inside the oven. Oh yeah, we're gonna burn your mum in the crematorium.